Hello! Welcome Hi. to Microbiology uh, Journal Club. Uh, I'm Faz Lam. This is my colleague, uh, Danny Chan. Hi. And we're here, yeah, we're here to geek out on microbiology, uh, to pick apart some of the... So this week is our off week, so we this is where we pick apart some of the uh, interesting sun, uh, news that has come out, especially around uh, SARS-CoV-2 and microbiology. Yeah, it's been a great way to uh, try to keep up with the headlines, and uh, we both have backgrounds in infectious disease from graduate school, and uh, in the following week, we try to choose one of the papers that we talk about in our news, uh, in our news week and go figure by figure, understand what they're trying to teach us, <clears throat> or convince us of, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, and this has been a fairly big week for news. For, so this week we'll be covering lots of different things. So uh, let me see what we've got coming up on the docket today. We've we've got like some bits on the societal impact and transmission, uh, some a new testing technology, some more information about the structure of like certain parts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how that interacts with the host proteins for infection, and of course there's treatment news and big vaccine news coming up this week so stay tuned if you want to hear about that yes vaccines for everyone well ho hopefully for everyone yes <laughs> <laughs> vaccines for those who want them and maybe yes. some of those who don't want them i don't we don't know um i hope everybody wants vaccines we should I, hope want so. vaccines. <laughs> I hope so too i hope that everyone can like have the right informed consent to take the right vaccines but who who knows it's a confusing <laughs> year um <laughs> Uh, so the first thing that we have on our docket is SARS-CoV-2 infection and transmission in educational settings, a perspective mm. cross-sectional analysis of infection clusters and outbreaks in England. <clears throat> yeah, this is interesting because it is a prospective analysis. So they set it, set it up in advance, which is always mm -hmm. a good thing to, when you have. So when you set out like what you're going to investigate before it, it means you can't like cheat so much. You kind of yeah, have to... A, a, it's harder to cherry pick out the data that gives you the significance that you want. Um, you're like thinking ahead of time about the potential confounding factors and writing that into your design. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, they looked at a database of schools and the infections that have occur in schools. And also hmm. they kind of correlate that to community outbreaks. So looking at the relation between like, if you're, there's this many outbreaks in the community, how, how probable are there to be outbreaks in the school? Also hmm. looking at staffs and students. So, uh, I mean, if a staff is infected, how how does that affect the students, or vice versa? I think. Yeah, I found this paper actually linked off of a National Geographic article or something like that, and it's like this long debate about um, our schools, right? Like, <laughs> is keeping schools open like a significant risk factor for community spread? Hmm. Um, and like, you know, that touches so many other issues, like <laughs> political, right? And sort of like yeah. what our social values are in terms of like these are important services right like yes there's a risk but it's also like we gotta provide services for the people um and so i think they were really trying to disentangle this hypothesis of uh yeah does the infection come from the school or does the school just sort of reflect the baseline risk of mm. the entire uh, of community spread um yeah which is a very difficult thing to to do because you want because again the the directional causality is very difficult to pick out in these sorts of situations. Just like, yes. you have to be very clear about the timing, and of course, the thing about this coronavirus is the timing is so hard to pick out because it varies. Like the two-week incubation time, I mean, that's even that's like not like set in stone. I mean, it might not be like the the amount of time. It just varies a lot, so it's hard, really hard to investigate this. Absolutely. So, that and so I, I don't know. I think I think the article ended up saying something like I'm not sure about this particular paper, but I remember the National Geographic article was sort of saying that uh, yeah, there is a risk for having schools open, but like it's not some like crazy increased risk um, that you would see in in those communities. I mean, I think this paper itself showed that most of the transmission events are uh, between adults <laughs> hmm. um, and not uh, not children. And I think that is, we may have something else about, well, maybe a bit later, but like, there's also some stuff, uh, you know, there's literature out there that says maybe children react differently to the virus. Yeah. Um, and that might uh, cause some of the differences that we see in transmission rates between uh, adults and children. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. So... Yeah. So, I mean, it's actually, it's quite an interesting paper for that, you know, because it is such a well-controlled thing definitely more stats based yeah <laughs> um and i guess like stuff that we could talk about on it would be like things concerning like the 
testing, you know, like what's that testing methodology? Right. Like how does that impact the types of numbers that they get back? Yeah. But uh, yeah, let's let's uh, look at the next one in the yeah, docket. Yeah, next one in the docket. We have psychological. The psychological. Oh, you, oh, go you go ahead. first. <laughs> Oh, I was just reading the title. The psychological impact of COVID-19 in Italy. Worry leads to protective behavior, but at the cost of anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just stumbled upon this paper. I was just going through the Frontiers uh, journals, and I was looking for whatever, and I was like, this is a great title. I, I love it. Um Because I think that, uh, you know, this is like science. To me, this is sort of how science um, can really help advance a discussion is that this sounds like something that makes a lot of sense right. right like it has like intuitive sense for people and um it's sort of nice to see maybe some data surrounding that like people who are actually trying to measure these types of effects and fold them into some sort of theory about how people think and how people work it can inform like health policy and stuff like that yeah i mean these sorts of things are interesting but the thing about the psych- I mean, from the outside psychology can seem somewhat uh, there's a lot of different schools of psychology, and some of them can seem like they don't rely much on experiments or reality that much. So it can be. Yeah. So I, I mean, this this is an interesting one though. Though I mean, they it's an online survey. They collected the mood of on, uh, participants in the early stages of lockdown, looking for signs of act- anxiety, and also correlating that to like say protective behaviors. Like, okay, are you washing hands more? Are you wearing masks? And seeing how that correlates, that do more is it that more anxious people tend to take more more protective measures? Or, Precautions. Yeah. Yeah. And also said <laughs> things like uh, gender and age differences, like wh- wh- who's more anxious of what. Uh, I didn't. I didn't actually look in the paper to see which one is. I mean, before reading it, I'm going to say maybe men because men are more susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 slightly. Oh, I, I didn't see how the breakdown. I didn't was. see how the breakdown I just, was. I could be the the takeaway that I was getting from it is that they do correlate yeah. right <laughs> the title says it as well right but like um like there is some correlation between like these uh worry me- metrics that they use yeah. <laughs> and protective behaviors um uh, <clears throat> and they kind I mean, of in the discussion they fold it into this like evolutionary fra- <laughs> framework <yeah>. right <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> but that's it like i think um It's actually interesting. Like in psychology, they do this a lot, right? They try to take all of what they are showing you and write like a theory to to explain, right, the data. Um, I mean, and yeah, yeah, Uh, and yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, and uh, it's just interesting because like uh, there are like there's also theories, right, that like a lot of the biological sciences, like sort of the the sciences that we're familiar with. Uh, at the bench sort of like try to enfold things in but um but yeah like the psych field is like they do it a lot and uh it's because i i think it's because that like those numbers by themselves like they don't they're very meaningless actually right like when you take online questionnaires sort of like in a vacuum um it could be anything right like it could just be the variation of the people of the time right and um like trying to speak to something more universal is I think what people are reaching for. But of course that means I don't know ever if the data can fully support the theories that they come up with because it is very based on cultural context and like what was their demographic sampling and so forth. So yeah, psychology is a really tough science to work in because you do have to cut. I mean, there are also, because again, like, I mean, if I work on a bacteria, I don't have to worry about bacteria reading my paper and suddenly changing the behavior because of it, whereas psychologists have to deal with that all the time. So yeah. <laughs> it's, so there's so many different things. And like, I think, I think every scientific paper tries to propose a theory to explain their data. That's mm-hmm. you. I mean, that's usually why I avo- avoid reading discussions of most scientific papers because, <laughs> because <laughs> it just doesn't. I just, it's like it, it's like different reasons, right? Like yeah. I think that when you read the discussion of a paper, like you're trying to understand that theory, but you have to, you can't just like absorb that theory and say, okay, that data is telling me this theory. It's more that that theory starts to exist in your mind with all the other theories you've heard, right? Yeah. And then maybe somewhere between the gaps, right? Like uh, especially in the data sets that you know the best, you'll start to suss out like, okay, I I feel fairly confident about this. I mean, my only point here was the I think are very important.
Um, only <laughs> like, sorry, only 11% of their sample lived in the Because there's other concern about SARS because you like, to the population and this infodemic where, where there's interesting aspects to look at of. Um, yeah absolutely yeah like uh, the people who are getting who who's getting the messages right to even go down this sort of path um mm-hmm. yeah uh so okay now we can go to okay. the next paper which is uh oh no uh Amplification-free detection of SARS-CoV-2 with CRISPR-Cas13A and mobile phone microscopy. <clears throat> yeah, now this is a fascinating one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it comes from, I think, the Doudna lab. Um, mm. Oh, yeah. Or, I think it did. Yeah, Doudna lab. <laughs> it's uh, Jennifer A. Doudna. So... Yeah, so this is the... Um, she, she's, one of her, she's, she's one of the discoverers uh, of... Uh, CRISPR-Cas9, is certainly in its application in uh, editing, right, yeah. of mammalian cells and so forth. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, we, so we often talk about CRISPR-Cas9, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is the Cas protein that binds and cuts things. Um, but there's like a whole bunch of different Cas proteins from my understanding, and some of them I think are better suited for different sort of tasks. Mm. So I think, I believe the reason why people use this Cas13 is because it has that guide RNA specificity, but then it doesn't necessarily cut things. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, in this one, it seems like it has a lot of specificity, but for what it binds to, but not specificity for what it cuts. So mm-hmm. so they have this like, uh, this, uh, this like complex of that like binds to SARS-CoV-2 and then just like clips any RNA that's near to it, which is useful for this application because they have these reporter RNAs that have like fluorescent tags on them that mm-hmm. are kind of expressed when they're cut. So this right. So yeah. So you're you're locating very specific binding to very non-specific cutting ability. Yeah, which is uh, uh which is really useful for this one because this is application free. So this actually cuts down the timing of how quickly. Uh, a sample can test positive, or because mm-hmm. amplification takes like can take like quite a, like hour to hours maybe to do maybe yep, uh, absolutely. just because you're waiting for like an entire enzyme to be created, whereas what's well, not an enzyme? Sorry, entire <laughs> strand of uh, RNA or DNA, sorry, yeah. to be created. Um, yeah, whereas in this case, it's they looking at the time as they say about five minutes it takes for this to to work. To work, yeah, because it's is... it's really just a it's an enzymatic reaction, right? It's like yeah. activate the enzyme and then make the color if the binding occurred. Um, and I think that they uh, they sort of link this to like the application in the field where you can make mm. um, I guess like little chambers filled with your reagents right like stick yeah. in your sample and then read out the color difference with your mobile phone <laughs> yeah i mean that th- this is a really nice paper for that because i feel like this they already they demonstrate their theory and application and mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you don't really often get that in papers and that's something that i really like kind of think is really interesting yeah 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 i mean a cool paper definitely big big name <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big name. Uh, big name, and I guess a big problem starts Kobe too. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, to me, like the the takeaway that I want to share with people is really just that, like, you know, CRISPR Cas9, like we talk about in the gene editing sense, right? Um, mm. But like part of the strength of that gene editing sense is this idea of the guide RNA being mm. able to like direct these proteins to the places that we want um, on yeah. other sequences, and so you can imagine that that ability to direct things where you want, that's kind of, you don't even have to worry about editing, right? Like just being able to direct to a diagnostic target, right, is uh, is is what's being exploited here. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's another great thing. You uh, With this technology, it can, can, you can use any guide RNA for it. Mm-hmm. So this doesn't just have to be for SARS-CoV-2. This can be for any disease that has like an RNA component to it. You can just do a test for it yeah. very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually... A lot more powerful than you for if you you want if you're not thinking beyond SARS-CoV-2, that potentially this could be a real game changer for yeah, uh, yeah, diagnostics. Yeah, a lot of different types of RNA diagnostics, right? With uh, CRISPR-Cas13, and I think that that was already said, but like here we yeah. have like a you know sort of like a high profile in the Times paper. Um, yeah. About an application of uh, the uh, Cas13. <laughs> okay.
Okay, let's see. Up next, Real? we have real-time confirmational dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 spikes on virus particles. <clears throat> yeah, this is quite a nice... Because right? th we've talked about last time how SARS-CoV-2 spike has different confirmations. Mm -hmm. And how that can be quite important for understanding how infection happens, and especially with that neuropelin binding. So to understanding how this confirmation... Will do so this actually looks at the switch between those different confirmations. Yes, on um, actual it, viral particles, from, from yes. understanding. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, there's like some cool techniques. I, we've never talked about these techniques. I think it's FRET they're using. Yeah. Um, so, so that's like uh, exploiting some interesting physical principles of like, you know, like fluorescent light exciting something close by and like sending other light through. Um, yeah, and, and they can basically, in as they say, real time, <laughs> um, show us like how these proteins are changing shape and how they're breathing. People always talk about breathing proteins, yeah. uh, wiggling noodles in space, <laughs> 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 all these different ways people talk about uh, protein conformation. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I mean, there's also there's some really fancy graphs in this, like the three dimensional graph with all these. So it does look like. I, mean, I've never, I don't didn't... really know how to read these. Like, like yeah, I don't know either. Now I'm just like, oh, okay. They uh, like... they laid <laughs> yeah they've laid distributions on three dimensions, <laughs> two dimensional yeah, is... distributions on a third axis. <laughs> which is great until you want to find the height of the peaks and you think you're like, okay, is that peak bigger because it's bigger or is it because it's closer to me? And I need to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So anyways, interesting from the dynamics point of view. I like this. We haven't talked about this set of techniques before, um, right. but they are kind of like uh, biochemical powerhouses, I guess one, one could say. Um, yeah. And yeah. Also in this uh, structure category, we have D614G spike mutation increases SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility to neutralization. <laughs> yeah. That so. could be like good news, right? <laughs> People can get excited about that. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a really, because, like, almost counterintuitive, because uh, as you probably know, the story so far with this new D614G is, like, the G version is much more transmissible than the D version, according to some studies that we looked at previously on the pod, on, on this, like, V show. Yeah. Um, and also, like, um, it's, like, taken over, basically. It's, like, the default, yes. like, version now. Yes, yeah, like... With your like the original radiation out of Wuhan, right? We saw most of the isolates pick up this mutation, um, right? And then they've been trying to sort out. We, we we've read a bunch of things, right? Where people are trying to sort out like, oh, is it more transmissible or infectious? Like, what what's up? What's up about that? Uh, could it just be founder effects, right? Um, but then here they're they're sort of relating back this idea. I think we talked about it that the mutation adds like a flexibility into the into the spike protein, and that's. Yeah one of the hypotheses as to why it is more infectious or transmissible, right, is because, like, oh, maybe it, like, binds easier to things, right? Increased binding. Um, but that also appears, at least what they're saying in this paper, is it maybe correlates to um, more exposed to antibodies. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, what they basically say is, like, the, these antibodies are more in the up configuration, so their RB, their receptor binding domain is much more accessible, which both makes it more transmissible, but also more accessible to antibodies. So, because it's like, the, the it's more freer, it can bind more, but it also binds more antibodies, which is a really interesting, like, kind of idea. Yeah. And so, they really look into the structural reason for this uh, this susceptibility, which I like. And, and like, I guess the thing is, like, neutralization is only one part of the whole immune story. So, it doesn't necessarily mean that, like, it's going to be, uh, re that it's, like, been attenuated, and that's why it's more, mm -hmm. it's spread more. Because, again, antibodies um, aren't just, like, there to stop it on its own. They're part of an entire system. So, um... Yeah, so, like, a little interesting short, I think, mostly title and graphical abstract in my mind. I'm not sure if I want to oh, dive yeah, into I'll... it so much. Um, but, yeah, just, I mean, right, I think that this just maybe highlights the fact we've been talking about... Or, me, people may hear a lot about different mutations out there in the world, right? And it's like... Yeah. A mutation can have so many different effects um, and you know as scientists like we have like very specific models that we interrogate those effects in but uh, new models new effects right <laughs> new yeah. questions asked um, just will change your understanding of what a mutation is all about 
Yeah, and going into more structural uh, data with looking at uh, non-structural protein one. Mm -hmm. So, got a so couple. I think we had on our docket we had had a bunch of things about NSP one, just yeah. like interacting with the immune system, like immune modulatory effects. Uh, so it looks like the scientific community has started to crystallize things for us. So, or, or like, not just our understanding, but, like, crystallize the protein. <laughs> um, or I guess cryo-EM. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure which one this is. So I believe this is a crystal structure. Um, so they they talk about, like, their resolution. So in this, in the first paper, they get it down to 1.77 angstrom. Ooh, which, that's, uh, that's very tight. <laughs> that's quite tight. Um... And then we've got a second paper which also looks at which also looks at crystallization from uh, for the same so structural characterization of non-structural protein one from SARS-CoV-2. It also creates a structure, but they bring it down to 1.65 angstrom. So <laughs> the who's, who's been thrown down. <laughs> yeah, damn. We need to get it even tighter. If you're a if you're a structural chemist out there and you think you can get it tighter, we want to hear from you so we can award you a prize. <laughs> um. But yeah, like, uh, you know, just like uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, we saw the crystallization of spike protein helping to direct efforts, right, towards uh, how to create vaccine targets and, and, right, and, and target drugs and build hypotheses as to, right, all the different sort of interactions that spike protein did inside of the cell. Um, here we have two reports of a structure for uh, the uh, NSP, the non-structural protein one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also tripping over saying that, because saying the structure for non-structural protein 1 feels wrong somehow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it has a structure in the realm of protein, but it's yeah. not structural for the virus. <laughs> yeah, so it's a blob that floats around the virus molecule. It's not part of the virus's, like, structure that it uses to create whatever shape the virus is. Right, and right. And when it, it does skullduggery when it goes inside a cell, um, <laughs> which we can find out more about in the next paper which is the structural basis for translational shutdown and immune evasion by the nsp1 protein of sars-cov-2 yeah i like this one like if we choose a paper from this group like we should probably follow up on this particular one because yeah now that we have structural information right like how is that actually affecting right it's it's functions inside of the cell um and yeah, they are basically looking at, I mean, this is very similar to the um, overview that we had looked at, right? They yeah. did that RNA-seq, or it wasn't RNA-seq, but it was like a chip, almost like a chip seek, right? They pulled down yeah. RNAs with the different proteins of SARS-CoV-2 and they found, oh wow, like it blocks some of these basic processes in the cell. And this is, um, instead of going from the screen version of this, they're just like narrowing down, right? Like NSP1, how is it working? <laughs> Yeah, this is great because it kind of. Sh I think they actually do like cryo electron uh, microscopy to look at how it binds to the 40 s ribosomal RNA structure and sees like how they bind the mRNA entry tunnel. I mean, um, yeah, because I think so in that screen paper they didn't actually directly observe that binding. It was just like from its similarity to other things, and then through some like phenotypic assays. So. Yeah, I feel like we've seen something like this on our paper when we did the replication organelle paper. Yes, but yes, yes, yes. And that's, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not sure if it was NSP1 in that paper, but again, I'm not sure if they, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because I know that they did, like, it, cause it's nice to have con confirmatory data. Also, it's quite nice to, because they, they put forward quite an interesting system. And that the thing about that replication organelle like paper was it was very thin on the actual, anything other than CRIM, it didn't really do much on. Whereas this does a lot of the other stuff right. that is quite interesting to actually. A lot yeah, the more paper like... that I was thinking about was not the. I'm not sure if this was the replication organelle. It was the inhibition of sp splicing, translation, and trafficking. That's that's what yes. was. That, that's what I was being reminded of here. Yeah, that's right. Because um, yeah, I... I'm just popping that paper open right now to maybe see if they wrote NSP1. I'm just gonna do a quick search of the PDF. Yep. Yes. Oh no, we, they don't. We, oh yeah, they do. They they find it. They find they it. They find NSP one in their screen, and it blocks uh, translation. So like this is exactly the thing that they're showing here. But in that paper that we read so many weeks ago, um, hmm. they didn't. They they only showed us sort of like the phenotypic outcome of those things. They didn't relate right. it back to like uh, a, a cryo EM image that shows us actually in that in that gap. Yeah. So this would. 
cap that off a bit, and I, I quite that's it's quite an interesting paper in that respect. Um, I mean, this is very much um, one of those things we're learning a lot more about, like how the virus works, right? In con like uh, against our immune system or our, like nor natural forces, I guess, or like normal operations of cell activity, how that's being disrupted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they kept I mean, that's throwing a... up that. Sorry, I just want to do the call, yeah. one of the callback stuff because I'm flipping through the figures here. Go and uh, it, uh, it, the one of the hypotheses they were throwing out back then was that NS, this blocking of translation is blocking um, interferon stimulation. That right, yeah. like those interferon stimulated genes, they're being blocked uh, from being made using this particular, uh, yeah, this particular effect. Oh right, and um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, transcripts have like a funny structure that prevents yeah. NSP1 from blocking them. Yeah, that was like the little yeah. story. <clears throat> that was the interesting part, and I hope. And they don't look like they, it doesn't look like they touch on that here. But, mm -hmm. but it would have been nice if we saw something like that. Because <laughs> yeah, because like this that... would be like the time to sort of dive in a little bit more, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So that is NSP1. We have... so that was like one aspect of like a host, a host like protein interacting with a SARS protein, mm -hmm. and so we're going to follow up with that with this new this paper called identification of required host factors for SARS-CoV-2 infection in human cells. Hmm. Um, so this is a CRISPR screen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so once again, an application of CRISPR. Um, I actually thought it was really cool. I I heard this person speak, um, and it's. Uh, there's actually a bunch of CRISPR preprints out there. So like a, a bunch of different people have done this sort of approach where they use CRISPR to break <laughs> uh, uh, every gene in a cell once, right? Like, so you have like a whole bunch right. of cells. Each one of them is like deficient in one gene. And then they see which ones respond differently to infection by SARS-CoV-2. Um, and from that, they generate a whole list of genes that are important for SARS-CoV-2 replication, and then they try to make a story from that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Like, from this list, what yeah. do, like, how, how can we explain <laughs> how can we explain this? Um, <laughs> and I believe the story about, in this paper, is about uh, cholesterol biosynthesis, something like that. Yeah. Like, there are some important cholesterol biosynthesis genes um, that are required for proper replication of SARS-CoV-2. Right. So, it's, so this is quite interesting. I mean, I think the... So, yeah, I don't think I've got much more to add apart from saying that this is quite interesting because those host factors can be interesting targets for treatment, perhaps, because you yeah. want to disrupt the SARS-CoV-2 cycle of infection. Absolutely. Um, yeah, like, so, again, we through this type of experimental design, you might uncover, like, a very important pathway, and then, you know, because people are making drugs for everything all the time. Like it might just so happen that we have drugs, right? Like for those pathways. And then we just haven't looked at them before. Cause we didn't know that that pathway was important for the infection. Yeah. Um, I, I also think that another reason to choose this might be interesting is to talk about this idea of like, well, neuropillin one doesn't come up in the screen, right? Like, like yeah. what's, what does it mean to do a screen like this and say that we understand the pathway? Because like there are many different things that could be happening, right? Like they they chose a very specific cell type to do the screen yeah. in. So really we're only understanding cell infection of the cell type, not all the different types of cell types that exist in the body. Um, so yeah, there is interesting information to be gained here, but it's also really interesting to think about the limitations because once again, I, there, people love CRISPR and you know it's easy <laughs> think that it's going to solve everything, right? But it's also really important to know as scientists, what are the limitations of these amazing tools yeah. that we're bringing here? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. So the next paper caught my eye. So it's called uh, Metabolic Reprogramming and Epigenetic Ta Changes of Vital Organs and SARS-CoV-2 Induced Systemic Toxicity. So the interesting thing is what they did is they, create, they created a mouse more model of like organ shutdown from SARS-CoV-2 and and while many papers would just go for like a, a lethal study and just leave it at that, this one they actually tried to pick about how, what exactly is killing the mice, why are they dying, what what is shutting down the organs, what is happening to these systems. So they do like autopsies and they try to diagnose what is actually happening, which I I feel like it's something that more papers should try to do because it's because uh, I I think I might have talked about this before, but I don't think death is a 
Death isn't necessarily the use, most useful endpoint. Yes, yes. Like, definitely have. <laughs> it's a good point. It's a good point yeah. to reinforce. Because what kills a mouse might not be what kills a human, so understanding what causes that death can be important for picking out what's relevant and what isn't. And that's kind right. of what this paper goes yeah, into. Yeah, it's like um, it's like a real, it's like a deeper understanding of how exactly that model relates, right? Because it's very crude to say death equals death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they look at di different tissues and look at like things like what's happening to the metal metabolism of those cells. What's happening to the the size of the organs? What what's ha what's shutting them down? I mean, how is SARS-CoV-2 actually killing? Which is uh, uh, something that we don't. What is do you, do you recall what the mouse model is that they used here? Is it uh, mouses making a human ACE2? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. yeah so I, th I think they used a mouse ACE2 model. So uh, so this was with using the adenovirus to give them human ACE2. Ah, so this isn't uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't like a purebred like ACE2 thing. They were, these mice were given it in uh, right. another virus. So so they. There's some. It's interesting, but it's not necessarily. The, the the question is like, how much does it reflect the human situation? You can only really. It's very hard to pick pick that apart, but. But, can but be quite basically, um, you know, other other papers that use this mouse model right now have this like better understanding, right, of what what they're actually um, studying, like what when they look at the death yeah. phenotype, right? Like it actually means these types of things, and that could influence the way you interpret that data. <clears throat> Yeah, and in terms of like also the because they mention epigenetic changes, which is quite interesting and makes me think about like long COVID a little bit, like about like if it induces these like long term changes, what do those mean? Sure. And if you can do something like that in mice, you can try and understand why that happens, and then figure out well, does a SARS CoV two do a similar thing in humans? Mm -hmm. So it's very much a uh, hypothesis generating and. There is like an argue, a question to be had about the ethics of having like lethal models like this because uh, like the question is like what do we gain from them and is that does that actually weigh up as well as like to uh, like the use of all these animals sort of idea like, yeah um... yeah like I mean are are these being used for, are we learning something important from these animal models or is it just satisfying our own curiosity that's the sure, always sure. balance when you think about animal research yeah and um, i think it's really hard in this circumstance too to make that call because right like um so yeah. many people have been infected right from the virus and and like there is like a bunch of unknown things out there we don't really know what will support oh. understanding those unknowns i mean yeah in this case it is a lot because like more humans have been dying of SARS-CoV-2 than mice mm -hmm. I, I mean the number of humans who have died of this like may, are much more than the number of experimental mice that have been used to study this model mm -hmm. so but um, I like that framing that like if it if if they can start to refine this idea of like what does it teach us about long-term effects or something like that like I can see some real value there because I think we won't understand like I think you know the world is very focused on like the problem right in front of us at the moment right yeah and so um the problem right in front of us is just like in general it's spreading around and people dying of serious disease but as things hopefully over the next two years or so right like calm down mm -hmm. a little then we'll be focusing on other things right like uh other transmission dynamics other long-term effects potentially <laughs> yeah Okie dokie. Okay, let's go to the next paper. So, SARS-CoV-2 protein interaction map reveals targets for drug repurposing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is just, uh, I think this is an older paper that I picked out. Um, and it just has like a, they just did like a really big screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just did a really big screen of um, all the different proteins that interact with... Uh, SARS-CoV-2, or yeah, um, and and then again they try to just make some blanket statements like, oh, this data might be useful for finding druggable targets. So it's very similar to the CRISPR screen, actually. Right? Yeah. This is in the protein world. <laughs> yeah, this is because CRISPR screen can pick out like indirect interactions a little bit because it looks at like uh, the whether they produce, but this one looks like directly what protein protein binds to it. So yeah. I guess you can create more directly druggable tar targets. So it's a lot more. Um, but yeah, it's just like one of those massive papers where there's a lot of data that we can 
Yeah, uh, look Nicole into. Picks, there's like these crazy network graphs, <laughs> human drug human target network, where they I guess like just point out like these. Um, oh, I guess it's all the SARS-CoV-2 proteins are laid out, and they just like draw little lines linking them to these clusters of things they interact with. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very busy graph. <laughs> Okay. And then we have therapeutically administered ribonucleoside analog MK4482 slash EIDD2801 blocks SARS-CoV-2 transmission in ferrets. Oh man, they really know how to name their name their drugs to be super like yeah, quick This is before it gets the brand name, right? Like Yeah. This is before it gets the fancy brand name which would be like something like oh, uh I like okay. future tide or something like that. I don't know. Um, um, but yeah, we haven't talked about some transmission models and their applicability in um, looking for yeah. therapeutics previously. So yeah, I mean, with so we've talked a little bit about ferret models uh, on on our news shows. I bet feel and yep. especially when it came down to the minks. Um, but and, here they're actually putting one of these models to use, uh, looking at a therapeutic, right? Like this is yeah. this is where you would hope that um, these transmission models could do a lot of clinical leg work, uh, or yeah. preclinical, I guess, leg work, right? In the in, in leading up to it, um, and I mean, also really, I mean, I like you know, I like this as a dovetail to. I mean, we're going into vaccines next. The next segment's mm. vaccines, right? But you know. Um, the vaccines haven't really been telling us a lot about asymptomatic transfer and the inhibition right. of transmission, right? We actually need other solutions uh, for that particular issue, um, just like having that virus, you know, maybe transmit around the population and then hit people who aren't vaccinated or people who are can't be vaccinated for certain reasons. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to hear the type of work that is going into preventing that element of the SARS-CoV-2 problem. <laughs> yeah. And as you said, we are going to go straight into the vaccina vaccinations. So, uh, so the next one we've got is design of a highly thermotolerant Im immunogenic SARS-CoV-2 spike fra fragment. Yes, um, I'd thrown this actually on the docket like a few weeks ago, but this is it got published now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it got published, and um, you know, as we think about the vaccines that we do have, right, that are coming up, right, on the horizon uh, in in many countries. Um, you know, there's also other, you know, they have, uh, there's many ways that they could be improved. Uh, and one of the ways is in storage, right? So this is talking about basically a type of subunit vaccine making the spike that doesn't have to be refrigerated in any meaningful way. <clears throat> yeah, um, the, the interesting thing that can come up is like, I don't know if you've been on Facebook, because I've been hearing a lot about how people are very worried about like this, there's a certain like, um, uh, was it, a uh, lipid that's, that's taken from sharks that people are worried about getting used in vaccines. And as far as I know, the only... Because it's used in this uh, adjuvant called MF59. Okay. Uh, which hasn't been used in any of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that we've looked at, mm -hmm. but it's here, so I can uh. finally... So, so <laughs> the question... So well, they don't actually mention that it's here. They say an MF59-like adjuvant. So, again, we don't know whether any sharks were harmed in this to make this paper. Interesting. But... I yeah, didn't realize. I, so, I mean, adjuvants are like such dark magic in the world of vaccine yeah. making, right? It's like something that we add into the primary antigen in order to elicit a better immune response. Um, mostly we find those empirically. Uh, the other thing that I liked about this paper is that uh, like in one of their later figures, they actually give us like a nice comparative uh, graph of all the different vaccines and the titers, the neutralization titers that they create in the different in uh, different animals. So they have guinea yeah. pig, mice, macaque, and human, um, and they have our Moderna, we have BioNTech, we have Novavax, and you can just see how they all stack up in terms of how they make neutralizing titers, which again, that's a very preclinical or like phase one style piece of data, but it's nice to see them all lined up together. <clears throat> yeah. All right, let's flip through us. Oh, rapid response subunit vaccine design in the absence of structural information. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, you added this. So I just wanted to like get, get a bit more info because 
I yeah, because I have this naive, and then you were telling me there's some news behind it. But you know, yeah. I, I I I just picked it up from a group that I was listening to. They were talking about, um, I guess, different types of vaccines that were out there, and uh, this is just this is a way of making subunit vaccines. So again, related to the previous one, something that's just made of protein, um, and it seems like they they basically um, tie together <laughs> potential. Um, immunogenic antigens with uh like a clamp of some sort that's that's their technology here um yeah i just thought it was interesting because it's like another version of making vaccines but but please tell me there's i mean yeah we've talked a little bit about because i know like we've talked about uh, different vaccines about the full-on domains how they the more sub units you have the kind of more likely you're going to get something immunogenic because you can get multiple antibodies binding to each other but this is something that was recently so this molecular clamp is based off of the hiv uh so let me pull up so it's so the molecular camp clamp is a trimeris, trimerization motif of 80 antigens that was derived from the hiv gp41 which self assemble into these stable like structures that can be used to to vaccinate and it's very stable the, the problem is like this was used recently it recently came up that a technology like this was used in an Australian uh, vaccine that was recently scrapped because it created HIV false positives. Mm, so, I see. So interesting. Yeah. yeah, because because you also make antigens to you also make antibodies to the this uh, multi or this fold on or multimeric what are you, they call it molecular clamp, right? But the yeah. thing that binds all of your target antigens together, you also make antibodies to that. <laughs> Which. Which is uh, a kind of a problem because it doesn't give you any. It doesn't give you anything like HIV, and I mean potentially it could like be an elicit an immune response to HIV. If, but the it's problem like is like it, right? Like you get false positives. Yeah, <laughs> you get false positives. So that means that those people who have the COVID vaccine won't, won't know that they got HIV. So that's yeah. a, so that's kind of pulled that vaccine to a halt. So it's cancelled a, a seven hundred fifty million dollar uh, plan for ordering a massive bulk. This creating this uh, coronavirus vaccine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a that's a real concern with vaccines, especially because you're giving them to large amount, right? Like vaccines are some of the pharmaceutical compounds that we give to like a really large part of the population, <laughs> right? Because like that's where their efficacy lies in herd immunity. Yeah. Um, and so if it does have some sort of cross reactivity with a diagnostic marker, then that can have real public health implications. Yeah. Because uh, apparently HIV tests couldn't be rapidly re-engineered to account for this, which is why they decided to uh, abandon this. So it's uh, yeah. wait, cannot you say HIV tests cannot be re-engineered? To yeah, it could not this. be rapidly yeah. re-engineered. So, right. so right. the fact is, they was either going like throwing out all these HIV vaccine tests for this yeah for coronavirus vaccine. They don't really know whether it works yet or not. So, yeah, that's. So that's an interesting thing. So this paper is interesting because it's a technology that I feel we're watching die in real time. Sure. <laughs> like <laughs> like this, this. Cause yeah, I, I feel that. No, yeah. that's interesting. That's it. It's interesting to think about that. Um, it also reminds me of the, um, it reminds me of the, oh, what is this one? <laughs> the square, the triangle needles, the tuberculosis vaccine, BCG. Right. Right. And that like BCG isn't given in North America. And one of the reasons they cite for that is because of its low, its low comparative efficacy. Right. And its ability to create false positives in the TB skin test, which means that you can't screen then for TB inside of like, uh, well, I got screened before I went to university (laughs) in sort of group living situations. Yeah. So this is going to be very interesting for historical importance by just, it's... Yeah, yeah, it's not. It sort of based on the based on the trial, right? That went through, right? And yeah. that, I mean, it's weird. I guess it's a subset of adverse events. <laughs> they were, yeah. they knew they were looking for it. They must have known, right? That it was a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I guess this will bring us on to the the big vaccine news, which is we've got. Mm. Uh, but so the AstraZeneca vaccine have now published their their results. So yes. they've got an, an, an interim, and it analysis. interim analysis of their results, yeah. but yeah. all nicely packaged up. Like they were the ones that had uh, they published before, right? Um, some some of their it was like a phase two three, and this mm. is just further down the line. <laughs> um, yeah. 
So this actually has data on like the people who got infected in each of these trials, so it should provide a lot more context to some of the confusion that was created by their press releases. And they've yes. they, Yeah, and these are all ongoing trials, but they've got they've pulled together a lot more information. And this is the interesting thing is like this is one of the few few trials where they try to look at asymptomatic patients. So not all of the trials involved in the study, but at least one of them I think look, tried to look at asymptomatic a asymptomatic patients. Well, yeah, they just have collected um, like nose swabs, whether or not they had they had uh, symptoms. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, this is basically this is I mean to to read this paper would be to dive into um, <laughs> would be to dive into the protocols again and really match up what they were saying in their press releases to what they've done here. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Right? That's, I think, and, a, big, a big aspect of why it's great to have this paper out. And the protocols are published as well alongside of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and the second one we've got is the BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccine, where they've got their, their full results as well. They, yep. uh, they they don't look for asymptomatic patients, but they do like have all the other kind of data that you'd want, and they've got their protocol available as well. Yes. Uh, so this one I did dive into more because this one is the one that has emergency youth authorization mm. in uh, Canada and the U.S. right now. Um, so I wanted to look at this protocol, yeah, specifically just to see like what is it, what is it helping? How is it helping people? Um, yeah. And, it seems like, yeah, it's going to reduce the incidence of disease that we're seeing in the population, which is great. That's one of those things where a mm. lot of you want everyone to get this type of vaccine because uh, the more people that get it, right, is the more disease, like disease just goes down, right, the amount that's actually happening. Um, I think their secondary endpoint, and this was very common for a lot of the vaccines I looked at, secondary endpoint is like serious, the rate of serious disease, because of mm. course that's a very important element. Like you want to say, okay, people don't get disease and like what about uh, more serious disease and then in this one did they also i think there has been that concern of um uh antibody mediated adverse events i think this one may also look a little into that uh just making sure that the antibodies that you make don't make worse disease in people um yeah i don't know this is yeah. great i'm like it, it was just nice to see this and to flip through the protocol <laughs> flip through the protocols um, and again, like, as you said, I'm like fixated on this idea of <laughs> transmissibility, right? And like, that's not like just stopping a baseline amount of disease isn't going to be enough because there's still going to be so many people that are susceptible. Um, yeah. And, and they, they do a good job in their discussion. They explicitly say, right, that this isn't going to tell us anything about that. They don't do enough. So they also do nasal swabs, um, mm -hmm. every time they see the people uh, during the yeah. study but it's like a very uh, small number of times that they see them um, yeah. yeah they only see them like six times over the course of all of this uh, but of course if they get symptoms then they then they switch to a different reporting structure and they get followed more closely <clears throat> yeah I think so I think we're gonna have to choose which paper we're gonna delve into next week and part yes. was, I, I want to put forward the idea that we either do do both of these vaccine papers or one of them okay yeah because uh it's big news right they're here they're coming <laughs> yeah uh, is... people are going to be wanting to put this in their bodies i hope <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah I mean, learning yeah. some of the yeah i agree i think that that would be a great idea um yeah i mean i, I have to admit like it's not the most interesting papers that we have on the docket but they are the most Im important i think for to explain to people explain to people to delve into and also like you know i might be getting one of these we, we, either of us might be getting one of these vaccines soon so i want to know the detail of how it was created so i can out nerd the doctor who's giving it to me um. <laughs> well actually i was going to say that um i was just talking to a friend who's a doctor and you know the doctors when they see, like the they have all these other concerns when they're giving mm. the vaccines right they're not necessarily reading these papers to say like mm. okay i know the ins and outs of this they want to know like is it going to cause adverse reaction what do we have to watch out for right yeah. like in terms of monitoring our patients who get these um but like in terms of like this idea of like efficacy the finer points of like what what the endpoints were looked at are um i don't think that necessarily every doctor will know and so it is nice to be uh 
it's nice to be educated <laughs> and, and yeah. feel some confidence that the product that you're getting um, is is going to work. Well, I guess how is it going to work, right? Because really at this point, all I know in my mind is vaccine reduces disease. <laughs> um, and I don't, I, I don't have a good understanding of the rest of that. Um, yeah, so two or one or both, right, is the big question. The figures, yeah. the figures in these uh, graphs, like, or the figures in these two papers, there are, again, they're not super in depth, right? They're kind of dry. Mm. There are reports of the safety and the baseline characteristics and yeah. how the study was done. And I think that if we cover them, um, we'll also put a, I want to put a focus on the protocols, right? How does, how yeah. does the protocol work? How did they enroll people? Who wasn't included? Who was included? Yeah. Um, those are like really important concerns. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm just looking at this Chadox one now to see the types of figures in here. Yeah, it's also like a table and uh, Kaplan Meyer survival style graph. I'd be okay with doing both actually. I think it would be yeah. it'd be cool. It would give us like something else to compare with. Like yeah. this is kind of spur more discussion than we would normally have just looking at one. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's important because, I mean, we are the host of the COVID-19 Vaccine Olympics, so I would, I'm eager to <laughs> declare a winner. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, as we said before, this is just like in this first round, right, of medals yeah. awarded, uh, first to first to market. <laughs> yeah, first to market, first to, uh, to publish, and, you know, yeah. we're just going to be rating their performance. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm up for that. That sounds like a great idea. Let's cover these, both of these guys. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, that'd be a, a good sort of thing. And I think there's something that people will be really interested in, in, mm -hmm. in doing mm -hmm. in taking a look at. Yeah. Um, so for next week, uh, we're covering safety and efficacy of the Chadox 1 and COVID-19 vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, an interim analysis of four randomized controlled trials in Brazil, South Africa, and the UK. That is the AstraZeneca vaccine that's coming. And we will also be covering safety and efficacy of BNT162, 162B2 <laughs> mRNA and COVID vaccine. That's BioNTech and Pfizer. Um, yeah. yeah, they're already winning on the title. You know, less words <laughs> for a title, better. <laughs> Way more Although, concise. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll Let's... go figure by figure and try to explain what's going on in these two clinical trials and hopefully be able to compare a little bit of the protocols for you guys. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions or things that you want us to pay attention to as we read through these papers, uh, make sure you tweet us or leave a comment for us in the comments below. Uh, and we will make sure to try to address those things. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for joining me, Danny. I've been Fazalam. Uh, this is my... Sorry. <laughs> uh, and this might, might thank you very much for joining me, Danny Chan. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll think of a good outro at some point. We'll definitely think of a good outro. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry about this. Anyway, yeah, this has been micro, our microbiology news. Next week, we're going to go in depth looking at the data, getting our teeth in, and really figuring out what, how these vaccines work. So, thank you so very much for joining us. Yep. Uh, I'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye.